Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabori here. I'm back after a week and a half, just taking a break, you know, watching some more of Disney Plus that I now have since Christmas. And I do watch some Netflix sometimes, and, and I also watch some more Blu rays and DVDs. You know, go on the computer, you know, just to check on something, watch some videos, the usual stuff. Um, also, I posted uh, nine commercial breaks that I found online just to keep up with the channel if you know if I want to take a break from recording videos. And just the start of the new year, 2021, I mean, it's a rough start, but I think it's going to get better. Let's hope so. I mean, we're still stuck in this, the leftovers of 2020. <laughs> but I did actually got a new pair of glasses, so you probably see how different I look now. Um, there's a new frames here. It's it's all gold on the edges and looks perfect and it holds uh, very well. But sometimes it slips down. Maybe I'll try to get some new uh, parts of these that will hold very well as long as it's not too tight. So it almost feels a little loose here, but it's perfect. I look, I look so much better now. Um, had to replace my previous uh, frames that I had um, in 2012. I figure why not because it was getting pretty worn out. I mean, I, I could still see clearly, but I think this one actually is much more clearly than ever. That's the case. And I'm also wearing a brand new T-shirt that I got as an early Christmas gift at Target, featuring all the Nicktoon stars. <laughs> yep, you could pretty much name them all. Yeah, Rockles Modern Life, along with Rugrats, All Real Monsters, uh, The Angry Beavers, and Hey Arnold, Rocket Power, and of course, Cat Dog. And there's even the Wild Formberries, too. So, yeah, they some of my favorites are included on this particular shirt, except for Cat Dog that I don't like. But whatever. I mean, it's a very nice shirt to have because, you know, I grew up watching Nickelodeon and all, and you know, I'm an 80s, 90s fan, of course. So, it's awesome. And you can even check on the back. It even shows you the, the logos of these shows. Um, maybe I could show you right now, if I can. <laughs> okay. If you can see it all clearly. But... Or maybe bend down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but with that aside, um, for my first uh, video that I'm recording, my review for 2021, I'm going to review, well, I figure why not, because even though Christmas had already passed, I want to review another sequel in the Home Alone franchise, because I only reviewed the first two movies along with the fourth one, which is the worst one of them all. It's going to be Home Alone Free. This time, Macaulay Cogan did not return. Neither is Joe Pesci, Daniel Stern, Catherine O'Hara, John Hurd, and the rest of the cast. Not even director Chris Columbus this time. Uh, they were going to plan on doing the third film originally uh, during the mid-90s, but because... Hogan had retired from acting after his last film in 1994, which was Richie Rich. He decided to take a break, or perhaps decided not to act for, for quite a long time, uh, until 2002, or three, when he finally made his return with the movie Party Monster, his first adult film. Well, the good some might as well be, but whatever. Um, but he also did another film called Save, uh, before he decided to leave acting and just move on with his life, um, especially when he was, you know, dating or pretty much in a relationship with Mila Kunis from that 70s show, but then, you know, they didn't work out and, you know, he was having some drug problems and all, but now he, he came clean and sober, now he's back to the way he was. 
but he's now an internet star, becoming more relevant than ever before on his bunnyears.com. So now he gets to join in with the Red Letter Media crew and the Cinemassacre crew, you know, James Rolfe, and, you know, get to hang out with a lot of people here. I mean, I'm just glad to hear that he's, you know, he's still working around. And I believe he just did a movie, too, but a, an independent movie, but I'm, I haven't seen it, so I got to look, look it up somehow if I can. But it would be nice to see him in movies again, even at his age. I mean, he's now in his 40s. I mean, I can't believe it. He's, he just turned 40 uh, last year. So I guess, you know, he'll probably soon keep up with what he's doing. Okay. Okay, well, anyway. So by that time, um, he was going to play a teenager. Maybe this time they're going to focus on what's going to happen next. Maybe they're going to have some new set of crooks or everything. But after he wasn't available, they decided to rework the script. Yeah, John Hughes um, wrote the script, just like he wrote the first two. And decided to have uh, a different cast this time. So instead of focusing on the McAllisters, they focus on the Pruitts. And that's where we got this, this child actor named Alex D. Lynn. Who you may have recognized him from all these McDonald's commercials back in the 90s. Uh, before he ends up having his, I think his first role, or, oh no, maybe it wasn't his first role, because his first role, I, I believe, was the movie The Cable Guy. Uh, I think it was a small cameo. Yeah, if you remember The Cable Guy, the one with Jim Carrey and <laughs> Matthew Broderick, which was directed by Ben Stiller. <laughs> a very underrated comedy. But he also made an appearance in in the movie called uh, One Fine Day with George Clooney, you know, who at the time was doing ER. Yeah, and he was also in the movie From Dust Till Dawn, among others. Um, and he's joining in with Michelle Pfeiffer. So what do you know, because both of them were doing two Batman, <laughs> Batman movies. Well, of course, Michelle Pfeiffer played Catwoman, and George Clooney was ready to become the next Batman. And we all know how that turned out. <laughs> Okay, but it also had Mae Whitman uh, from what, When a Man Loves a Woman and Independence Day before she became well-known. You know, she became a voice actress and all. And, you know, how the story went. <laughs> okay. So, anyway. So, he this, this is his first Home Alone film that he's ever done. And it all plays it like a whole standalone movie. Quite different from... From the first two films, so it's not a. Even though it, it follows pretty much the same formula, but but they added several differences here. Now, when this came out, though, I didn't expect that there was going to be another Home Alone movie after the first two films, because at the time, I was only um, just 11 years old, about to turn 12 in '97. I saw an episode. On Entertainment Tonight, and this is where they were talking about that they were going to do an upcoming Home Alone sequel that I didn't expect it to see. And they know that, yes, Macaulay Cole is not going to return because he's already a teenager at the time and since he retired. Um, that Alex is going to take over, and then they're going to do exactly what the story is going to unfold. I saw the trailer later on when I went to go see uh, Good Burger. Yes, I saw the trailer when I saw it at the Igorot Plaza. And I was surprised how this is going to turn out because I was actually very excited for another Home Alone movie to come out uh, during the the winter of '97, which is Christmas time. This is perfect, and it looks really cool. I mean, because at least they're doing something different. Over the years, as if as fans have gone along, well, you know how it is. I learned that. Um, well, I know Cisco and Ebert didn't like the first two films, but apparently Roger was the only one, maybe out of the few critics, that actually defended the film and actually loved it more than <laughs> than ever before. He, he, I mean, he loved it more than the first two, which is shocking because it doesn't even hold a candle to it. That's the problem. I mean, no one can match uh, Macaulay Cogan. Because of the way his character is supposed to be. He's a smart, um, ingenious uh, 
character who just has been treated like shit from his family. I mean, he has a huge family living under one roof. And and he's he's like the only one that gets treated like shit. And he wants to be at home alone. That was the whole idea of the story, which that he just made his family disappear even though it was basically an accident because they were under rush to the head all the way to um, to France, you know, for crucifixion. And of course, the second one, which is a repeat, but that's okay. This time he was hoping they were gonna not make this mistake twice, but that's basically how that happened when he ends up taking the wrong train, uh, the wrong plane. You know, after he was trying to get some batteries uh, that was inside um, his father's bag. He should have gave him the batteries as much as he can, but I know then it wouldn't be a movie. Anyway, but the the story about this uh, sequel is about um, Alex Pruitt, who um, just got the chicken pox. He's eight years old. You know, he has a lot of gadgets at his home. You know, he lives with his family, the Pruitts, which he has a, a little older sister along with his older brother. Uh, lives with his mom and his father. You know, they're often busy. Of course, you know, they're, his brother and sister always make fun of him and all. You know how it is. I mean, he has to stay home alone, so that way no one can get caught by the by his chicken pox. Um, meanwhile, we have four dangerous criminals who are international spies who are about to take a mysterious microchip, which is going to lead to uh, terrorism. Yeah, I know. Some plot for, for this particular story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. So, anyway, when I saw this movie in theaters, um, I had a good time. I was 12 years old, and I, I went to see this with my mom, my brother Jason, and I think I, I think we joined in with Eileen as well. Uh, we were just having a good time, you know, because we, you know, well, we, we just want to spend like the holiday time just watching a movie. You know, this was at the time when I had cable as my Christmas gift because I wanted to have my cable back, and I wanted to watch Nickelodeon right here and other channels and all you know cuz you know I love Home Alone and I, I, I thought maybe the third film was gonna be able to be as as good as the first two I mean, that was the case um okay so I know the movie is not a masterpiece I could see that over the years you know it may have been stupid I know, I understand but is this movie the worst of the bunch? Well, that depends on what everyone says. And it's fine. I, I understand what people are getting at when they when they rate all the Home Alone films. But I, I never hated this movie, though. I never did. And even to this day, I, even watching this on Disney+, Plus, because I do have this on VHS. I don't have it on DVD. Uh, but maybe someday I might track it down. I just wish it was on Blu-ray already, and maybe I'll take that. If Fox can, or pretty much Disney, will actually take it. I mean, I just can't believe they're still stuck with just releasing the DVD only. And, and not the rest. But, and just only keeping the first two. I mean, the first one got a 4K release for crying out loud. Even for its 30th anniversary. <laughs> okay. I know, I, I'm taking pretty much of my time, but let's just get right to it. <laughs> anyway, it stars Alex D. Linz, who's now a teacher, by the way, I just found out. He, he was also later in films like Max Keeble's uh, Big Move. Eh, didn't care much. Uh, then, then he was in a movie called uh, Tarzan. He yeah, did the voice of the young Tarzan as a kid. So, And of course, he was in One Fine Day and, and also a bit role in The Cable Guy. Uh, Havilland Morris, who I believe she was in the movie uh, Sixteen Candles. Um, I think she's been in other stuff. Um, 
but she's now uh, working as a real estate agent. It's good to see what she's doing now. Uh, but she's also a Broadway actress. Oleg Krupa, who well, you may remember him from the movie Eraser. Uh, he was also in Blue Streak and in, and in The Italian Job, uh, the remake, uh, with Mark Wahlberg, Charlie Sferon, and, and um, <laughs> all the rest of the cast. Uh, Waya Kelstead, um, as you may remember, she was actually in the movie Deep Impact. I, I have the film on Blu-ray. Uh, but she was also played um, Gary Hobson's uh, ex-wife in the TV show Early Edition. Um, she didn't appear in the pilot episode, but she did appear um, for the first half of the first season. So at least now you'll recognize her. Uh, once you see her. Uh, she's been in other stuff too. Lenny Bondolin, you may remember him from Electric Dreams, uh, who played the, the architect Miles Harding. Uh, he later went on to do uh, the TV show Twin Peaks. I, I forgot to mention when I did that review of Electric Dreams, uh, but I did mention he was in this. And he was in other stuff too. Um, he's a great actor. Uh, David Fortin, uh, who happens to be, of course, the husband of Grammy Award-winning singer and songwriter Cindy Lauper. Yeah, the girls who gave us the song, Girls Who Want to Have Fun. <laughs> um, he went on to do uh, films like The Notebook, uh, that terrible The Un the Other Woman. He was also in John Q. I think he was also in the movie uh, with Sarah Jessica Parker, Ben Stiller's in it too, called If Lucy Fail. Um, eh, it was okay. I'm others. Kevin uh, Kildner, Scarlett Johansson, yes, she was in this movie. Um, even after <laughs> she was in the film uh, North, that was her first role. And that's how she became uh, very popular over the years. Went on to play uh, Natasha Romanoff, uh, a.k.a. Black Widow, in, in, in the Marvel films. And I know she went on to do a lot of great work. You know, everything, like Ghost World, uh, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, uh, The Perfect Score, Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, 2017 live action adaptation and many others. Even Lucy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Seth Smith. Uh, Marianne Seldes. She passed away a long time ago, but she's done a lot of uh, television and stage and film, radio, and all. Uh, Christopher Curry, Baxter Harris, uh, Neil Flynn. Yes, Neil Flynn from. Went on to do the TV show uh, The Middle, and I know he was in the um, Mean Girls. Um, yeah, he's, he plays one of the officers. Uh, Freeman Coffey and Adrian uh, Duncan. It's written by John Hughes, of course, who wrote the first two films, and yes, he wrote several other of his works you know, before his, his passing. Uh, which the story is actually based on by Hilton A. Green. And it's directed by Raja Gosnell, yes, who has been a long-time editor for the first two Home Alone films, among others. But, of course, he went on to direct the movie, a great follow-up, too, called um, Never Been Kissed with Drew Barrymore. Yeah, she's now a talk show host. <laughs> but she's a great act. But she's always been a wonderful actress. And I love that movie, but I know she, but I know Roger Gusnell went on to direct those terrible Scooby Doo live action movies, and also went on to do the Smurfs live action films, which I enjoy more than, than those Scooby Doo ones. So of course you know the story. The movie begins set around January. We meet four intelligent international spies: uh, Peter Bolpre, the leader of the gang, joined by a female. Alice Ribbons, along with two males, Burton Jernigan and Earl Unger, all played by Oleg Kupra, uh, Waya Kalstead, Lenny Bondolan, and David Forden. 
They were working for the North Korean terrorist organization by stealing a $10 million missile cloaking microchip that they're going to be sent to, uh, to connect all the missiles that, that's going to be launched all the way through the U.S. So the spies had placed it inside a Tyco RC mutilator remote control car. You know, the ones where you, know, you can do a lot of great tricks and awesome ones too. Like you do all these 360 spins, those uh, awesome high jumps, and you get to drive around with it uh, with the remote control. Um, of course, I did explain that my brother Jason had the, the Wolverine character from X-Men. And I got stuck with the Batman Forever remote control uh, Batmobile, which it sticks directly into the remote control by this the small wire. Mine was a piece of crap. It's very ugly design, as you can see. But uh, I got so jealous because he actually has the Wolverine and he gets to ride around with the Tyco RC and have fun with it while I get stuck with this. That I got from KB Toy Store. Okay, well, anyway, uh, they're about to sneak it past the security at the local airport, but due to this one cliche, as you as we expect from movies and TV shows, where a luggage mix up causes a an elderly, bitter old woman named Mrs. Hess, who's played by Marianne Sudez to take the spies back containing the car before returning home to Chicago and it was placed inside the the Parsian French bed bag yeah which a lot of people have used it for for other uh, stuff that they have to bring you know some extra luggage or or this rate you know bring some rolls of or French bread of any kind <laughs> so now the four spies had to go on board to Chicago and systematically search every house in Hess's suburban neighborhood to find the chip, you know, before they end up being eliminated from their jobs. Meanwhile, we meet a pint-sized eight-year-old boy named Alex Pruitt, who's played by Alex D. Lynn, who lives with his family, Karen, his mother, the, the beautiful red-headed girl, uh, the beautiful red-headed woman, played by Havilland Morris, joined in by his father, Jack, played by Kevin Kildner, along with his older siblings, his brother Stan, played by Seth Smith, and his sister Molly, played by Scarlett Johansson. Anyway. Uh, he had to continue uh, shoving some snow through all the driveways of every neighborhood, including Mrs. Hess, which she lectures him for scratching in public, because that's when we learn that he has the chicken pox. He was very shocked. So now he has to stay home from school while the parents are away. Yeah, home alone together. But he does actually have a lot of gadgets around. And also likes to spend some time in the neighborhood or, or even watch TV or, you know, play around with his uh, rats, a white rat that he got. All that stuff <laughs> that he has. So he was also pulling some pranks, um, such as, you know, uh, taking out his TV remote uh, to switch channels um, on Heiss's... Uh, neighborhood and uh, at Heiss's house and while she was uh, continuing to smoke yeah you see all the the smoke coming out of her nose and so channel surfing and that's where it leads to that Jamie Foxx uh, centrist music video <laughs> I mean I know I know it's it's pretty cruel but hey he has to have fun for a change while the spies themselves ends up uh, picking up uh, a new home, so that way they'll be able to continue their search. And when Alex suddenly uh, looks up on his uh, telescope just to see what's going on in the neighborhood, that's when he spotted uh, one of the spies, which of course is Peter, trying to search for the chip, and that's when he decides to call the police. 
did it twice in a row for two neighbors which at that rate they stole their dog and now um, no one would believe in his story and they claim that he was making false alarms and I understand because that's part of their job you know they have to do what they can because now this is going to become you know a true embarrassment to the neighborhood so of course there's going to be a lot of repairs with the doors and everything but the cops doesn't seem to like search like the top of the roof, the ceilings, or any other, just to see where he hits um, during the second time around. But I know the the spies had got away as soon as possible, so they they couldn't get caught. Anyway, but to make matters worse, uh, Alice um, eventually suspected that it was the kid, and and he figured she figures it out by trying to uh, search for for Alex or at this rate uh, when when Karen was just about to you know head off to work um, already with Jack you know hitting for a business meeting and all that's when they well that's when you know that Alex is already in deep trouble when he began to find out who it was um, also, I guess I forgot to mention that uh, Stan actually has uh, a pet uh, parrot who does all these wisecracking jokes and all. <laughs> it's just, of course, he's he's the best part of the movie. Anyway, just to uh, get some more proof, uh, Alex attached a, a camera to his remote control car just to use it to spy on them to see if they're going to go after them as soon as possible and and indeed they did because it leads to a longer chase you know where <laughs> where Earl suddenly gets run over by Burton it's a mini ban just when he was trying to head out uh, joining in with Peter and Alice and of course when there's even one scene where was when Alice uh, picks up the car and <laughs> Alex spots it and just drove off and it just went straight <laughs> out of her hands and <laughs> it creates a tire mark on her face and then and there's another, another scene where they try to grab the car as soon as they can but both Peter and, and Alice they bump their heads <laughs> all those other crazy uh, slapstick so then um, Alice was trying to wonder you know what they were going after and that's where they he found out that the chip was inside so he forms the local Air Force recruitment center about it, but trying to see if they can get forward the information about the chip to the right authorities but they seem like you know they think this was mostly contained on all remote control cars and any other electronic devices so they obviously didn't realize that until well later on when they finally get it to the right authorities to yeah the federal authorities to to now trace it and now that's when they're about to head to Chicago to to find Alex which eventually they, they found him at school well they were going to but they want to <laughs> you know where of course Molly and Stan are you know with uh, Karen and that's where they were shocked about the news that they were about to hear and if that was the case, um, because with all the failed attempts that Alex had to deal with, he decided to actually form a new plan, and that is to set up booby traps. You know, just like how Kevin had done that in the first two movies, because it follows the same formula, but in a whole different storyline. Because they, they had been finally watching Alex... Um, and decided to break the house as soon as they can while the traps was all set. You know, this yes, the traps in the movie was incredibly as brutal as Home Alone 2, but even more uh, bumps to the head and a lot of blows and all. Where this is where it all starts where Alex actually sets up all the electrical wires uh, connected directly into the the front uh, porch. Uh, which Haxie had all these marbles uh, hidden inside the the welcome uh, mats, <laughs> and then he had like 
the, the trampoline the, that's being disguised inside a swimming pool and uh, lots of uh, books that's inside a trunk uh, of the attic and also a dumbbell to throw in and <laughs> there's like so many of them too because that's how uh, <laughs> in that one scene where um, both Burton and, and Earl were <laughs> were about to enter the house but uh, they got electrocuted by the electrical wires um, that's all set up I mean same goes with uh, a burden when he wants of you know sitting down <laughs> and then of course he you know he jumps into the mats which went straight into a face plant of the door and then that's where you know Peter came by and, and ready to um, yeah <laughs> start where they where the trunk fell on them and then next the dumbbell um, he tries to enter the door and then that's where he got sucker punched into his gut you know by the uh, the boxing glove and then later he he accidentally um, pretty much I think almost shot himself with the with his shotgun and and then yeah because he had it on his hand he also got uh, spray painted through his eyes well, Earl, uh, Burden, on the other hand, just, um, well, he got sprayed with the water holes. He got frozen for a little while, but then he got, he got through and then tries to go all the way into the house, you know, going all the way on top of the window, and then he fell all the way down into the bathroom, which then the toilet seat broke. Um, he also had a haircut from the lawnmower. Earl, on the other hand, uh, got caught by plaster, you know, with the shoe actually going straight into his face, and and then all that plaster went to his face, and then next, um, he actually got caught by these the the makeup blocks uh, uh, boxes, which which all has glue on it, the aesthetic uh, adhesive uh, glue, adhesive glue, and and he's just rolling around and then once up going all the way down into the basement <laughs> there's like a, a front flips and then next thing you know he got caught by the mouse trap and and then accidentally shot the pipe where all that feces went onto his face Ugh. uh... alice on the other hand just went by you know to the backyard and then got caught by the glue and then next uh, she got caught by <laughs> Uh, the two uh, flower pots and then ones up landing into this muddy uh, ground <laughs> then she had to try to get inside the house which yeah she did which she tries to uh, go all the way for the back door and then he uh, it breaks apart and then she does like a, a back flip and then ones up going landing all the way down into the uh, basement of the house and Peter joined in too later. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's there's a lot more that you have to tell <laughs> for the story. Um. Okay, but then once they all got into the house and ready to chase um, Alex around, uh, <laughs> uh, Burden suddenly got caught by uh, Alex's pet uh, rats, and that's where, <laughs> which is similar to Home Alone. You know where Marv tends to take uh, the crowbar uh, to hit the tarantula, uh, which got caught on uh, on Harry, but he accidentally hit him. Well, it's very similar to that, only it's with the rat, which got caught into his uh, pants. And this is where you know he's he screams in pain, got hit in the nuts, saying, "You hurt my winky." <laughs> Well, if, if you had changed your pants once in a while, you wouldn't have rats in your pants. Well, if you changed your shorts once in a while, you wouldn't have rats in your pants. So they just continue the search to find Alex before he finally escapes. And that's when uh, both uh, Burden and Earl was ready to jump onto the trampoline to, to go after him. And then, well, now that's where it crashes into the swimming pool and that's how they got frozen.
<laughs> um, Alice was ready to chase Alex, but wants up going all the way down to the Dumb Raider elevator, and that's where she fell in. And yeah, she pretty much broke her fall. Uh, Peter and I, and of course, uh, once again, Alice uh, actually had tied up uh, Mrs. Hess in the garage um, after they spotted her. And now, um, and she even let the door open too. So now Alex finally came and to her rescue. And so Peter finally came and took his gun, which this was a trick too, which he found out that, because <laughs> trying to find the, the chip, he found out that um, that's not your gun either. <laughs> it was a dark gun, but then he, he tricks him saying, this is your gun. And it scares him off and it turned out to be a bubble gun. <laughs> so now he's been hidden somewhere in, in like a igloo, I think. And um, that's where he got caught by the parrots. And this is where he's like saying, double or nothing. <laughs> Just when he only had one cracker left. And that's where he starts the fireworks. <laughs> Just as soon as the cops had already arrived and, and spotted him. Because he was hidden somewhere. I mean, they already got the bad guys now, um, just along with the federal agents joining in. And now they got arrested, which leads to at the final climax where they all got chicken pox. All four of them. <laughs> Very funny. While the Pruitts, and, along with Agent Stuckey and Hess, were celebrating Jack's returning home from a business trip, while Alex's house is being repaired, so it seems like a great luck for for the rest of the Pruitt family to finally have the freedom that they could choose. It almost feels like it was going to be a party, but it sure is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, it's not perfect. I understand. I, I can see why it's inferior to the first two, but I still think it's enjoyable nevertheless. It's a decent time waster. And I like it for what it is. I never hated it. Um, I know it's hard to to compete against one or the other, but if anything, I would rather watch Home Alone Free a whole lot more than than the followers that, that led to it, which is all direct to video shit or perhaps TV movies, because they're technically TV movies anyway. Which the quality looks uh, incredibly cheap and terrible and and a waste of a cast too and, and the characters are just as nasty and mean and horrible too I mean come on um, I would definitely say that Alex D. Lind uh, did an excellent job uh, portraying the role of of his own Alex <laughs> as a character um, well of course it's it's tough to uh, compete with Kevin McAllister that Macaulay Culkin does, but he, but like him, he, he did. I mean, for even for an average uh, kind of guy, he was he knew exactly what he was doing, and he was smart. He was intelligent. He you know he you know he's like the big man of the house, even though he's the smallest of the group. But it seemed like he he could take care of himself, and. The way he sets up those traps, which I, I know it's as brutal as it could be. It's as goofy. Hey, it's it's a family film. I mean, what do you expect, guys? I mean, it has total slapstick all the way. It's so wacky and and crazy. I mean, that's exactly what a Home Alone film has to be. Um, and as for the rest of the cast, uh, Hovland Morris was beautiful. I mean, yeah, I guess there are times when... She kind of was a little rough on him, but that's understandable because she cares for him. Um, Kevin the Kilner wasn't seen much, but I, I know there was a scene where he, he got so nervous, you know, trying to get ready for a business trip, but then he accidentally <laughs> forgot to put his pants on. <laughs> uh, Sarah Johansson, I mean, even for her earlier roles, I mean, it's great to see her. As young as she'd be. I mean, she was only, uh, believe it or not, she was only 12 years old at the time when, when she did this. Uh, I was, which at that point on, I, I did turn 12. 
and uh, joining in with uh, Seth Smith, which I think he was in another um, short film that he was doing or something. I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, I think he was in the Michael Jackson's Ghost. I forgot to mention that. Uh, I I think that's where he was in. So I don't think he hasn't done much though. Um, uh, as for the villains, though, um, of course, the international spies, uh, Oleg Krupa um, was fascinating, as well as uh, Waya Kelstead. I mean, she really was pretty tough on Nils, too, and I gotta admit, she is pretty sexy, too. Uh, Lenny Bondolan, um, great to see him. I mean, he has, he has a lot of intelligence here. Uh, Unger, you know, Earl, you know, played by David Forden, great, great actor. Um, so I, I would say everyone else was good. Um, nothing problem with that. I mean, through all the silliness and the goofiness and all, it's it's what it is. And and of course, I love the parrot, who's like as wise cracking as it could be. He comes up with all this other jokes from, and also sings too. <laughs> Especially in the scene with the. Uh, with that naked um, swimsuit model, could be a Playboy or whatever, uh, that's been hidden through all these uh, post-it notes uh, that was hidden while he, they used the, the cutout board into the shower while <laughs> the pair was singing Green Eyed Lady. <laughs> that was very funny. And by the way, the soundtrack was actually great too. They they had a lot of great songs to join while they, the score was done by Nick Glennie Smith took over for John Williams. Even though they did use a little bit of the score from John Williams. Uh, but the the song called My Town by a, an oddly group named Cartoon Boyfriend which is a song like this. If you're ready to see hell come in then and ring the bell. Yeah, I remember that song. And they also had uh, the song by Owingo Brengo. He had Danny Elfman's band, uh, which it's been heard in the movie Wisdom with uh, Emil Estevez, who also directed the film, along with Demi Moore joining in, which is a song called Where are we going? Where are we going? Home again? Home again? Yeah, the song Home Again. <laughs> so, uh, I, again, I. I enjoyed it for what it's worth. It's not, it, it, you know, just for the sake of it. Um, but I understand if you don't like the film, that's fine. I'll, I'll respect everyone's opinion, okay? Now, as for Roger Ebert, though, who's a legendary film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times and from the syndicated uh, TV series Cisco and Ebert at the movies or sneak previews or whatever, I respect his opinion on it, but I still disagree with him on certain levels. And it's not better than the first two. No doubt about it. Does not come even close. I'm sorry, but I. But hey, we all have our difference of understanding and all. So we'll keep it that way. Uh, therefore, I hope Home Alone 3 does get a Blu-ray release. I mean, come on. It's been on DVD for a very long time, and I think Disney should really take a chance out of it. You know, I, I know I, I saw the article, but I doubt that that's ever going to happen. I mean, maybe this time they'll probably uh, fix this problem, and they'll actually go back to releasing more catalog titles from them, especially 4K releases. But at that point on, I hope this time they will finally will get a Blu-ray. For sure. And even with features, too. And hopefully Home Alone 2 will get a 4K as well. I mean, after they release the first movie for its 30th anniversary. This better not be one of these anniversary editions. Just put it out already, okay? Get it over with. I mean, not everything has to be available on Disney+. Plus nor digital uh, streaming and and codes that you can get from all the physical media. Come on. Deserves better. It's the last theatrical film we ever got. The last sequel because the direct-to-video ones, or which is this rate, the TV movies, really suck ass. 
and it doesn't hold a candle to all three of them. <laughs> Especially how lame the, the traps look and how stupid the characters are. I mean, this is the one movie I can deal with, as well as the first two films. That's all that matters. So, anyway, that's Home Alone 3, and I give the film three stars. Just to be not only generous, but just to be kind, in a way.